is the chair of the LGBTQ2S committee, Sabrina. Hello and welcome everybody. Today we have a special guest, Ed Broadbent, who is most commonly known as Ed. He has had many professions, from being a political scientist to an aviator and a professor, now to being a politician. We have invited Ed here to Owen Sound because he is not only the founder of the Broadbent Institute, he is also the former leader of the New Democratic Party. With the Broadbent Institute, he does research, works towards equality, promotes a message of democracy, and strives towards a more balanced economy. The research helps to educate and influence those in power to make decisions that will help the public. The Institute alone is a big movement for just one person to start, but it's not all that Ed has done in his life. In 1984, he led the NDP to be just behind the Liberals by 10 seats, after which he was shown to be the most popular leader in Canada by quite a few polls. This was a first for the NDP. My grandma remembers canvassing for him during his first by-election in which he was elected, first elected. My grandparents also told me that when Tommy Douglas was the leader of the NDP and the government was considering the War Measures Act, Ed played a key role in getting people to vote against the act that would end up with Canada being involved with the war. He showed the courage to speak for what is right even though the NDP would lose a lot of support for it. Today's interviewer will be, for Ed will be Michael Valpi. Michael is a part of the NDP executive for this area and was a journalist for the Globe and Mail. He wrote articles about politics and human interest stories. The questions that will be asked of Ed are ones that have been collected in advance. Now please welcome Michael Valpi and Ed Broadbent. I, I was uh, about to say, outline what I think are three crucial aspects of what a social democratic party and movement are all about and characterize uh, certainly the NDP. But the point I do want to make is that this was a, a global change that particularly show revealed itself in the post-war years. Just think of what went on in, in, in our own country. Very often it's said that we, we really replicated or copied what was going on in Western Europe. But uh, the reality is what was going on in Canada was going on at the same time in Western Europe. In 1943, in this province, good old then as it was regarded Tory Ontario, the NDP came, to, or the CCF at that time, came within a few seats of forming a government in Ontario. The same year, 1943, the party came within a few seats of forming a government in British Columbia. In the su subsequent year, 1944, we formed a government. Tommy Douglas led the, the, the CCF to form the first social democratic government in North America in, in Saskatchewan. So we, right across Canada, our movement was building and it was doing so at the same time as in Western Europe. The great landslide victory of Clement Attlee and the Labour Party in England in 1945 established the social democratic movement as a, a deeply uh, popular uh, transformational uh, part of British history, uh, established the welfare state. At the same time this was going on in Scandinavia and in, in post-war years in Germany and in, in the Netherlands and also in France. And what are the, the characteristics of this, this movement? And, and for most of Western Europe in the period from 1945 to 1975, there were social democratic governments or a version of a Christian democratic movement. But for most of that period, a good part, at least 50%, social democratic parties were governing Western Europe. The characteristics of those, and they were right up to the NDP today, what are they? First of all, there's a, a, a basic fundamental uh, uh, commitment to the idea of equality, that differences, economic differences, 
within society should not be great. And the government has an obligation to work at policies and programs that may, would make sure that we don't have deep inequality. So a, a central concern of social democratic movements has been the value of equality. The second is a commitment to, for most things in terms of commercial activity to the market mechanism. If we want to buy a dress, if a woman wants to buy a dress, or a, ma a man or a woman wants to buy an automobile, no one seriously says they should be made uh, manufactured by the state. The market mechanism can be used effectively for many, most of our goods and services. But fundamentally for social democrats, there are aspects of our life that should be taken right out of the market. That we should have certain rights as human beings that shouldn't be measured in dollars and cents. And that has been of great importance. It led to the establishment of Medicare by Tommy Douglas in Saskatchewan, and it's led to the demand for many called social and economic rights that have followed, in the, followed that at both at the provincial and federal level in Canada. So these characteristics then, equality concerns, rights concerns, social and economic rights are taken out of the market and a concern with building equal societies have really characterized uh, the CCF and the NDP up to this day. And they're part of uh, what has gone on, as I say, particularly in Western Europe and spread to Australia and New Zealand, of course, um, in, in the post-war years. Um, let, let me just, I, I did some checking uh, yesterday before I, I came to, I, I think we'll have some questions about inequality I'll deal with in a minute. But I looked at the tax rates for today. Today, I, as many of you will know, after, after four years of Mr. Trudeau, from, from 2015 up to today, we have the same level of inequality in Canada as measured by objective data, not, not partisan information. The degree of inequality hasn't changed in Canada. So I, I did some looking at tax rates. And in 1971, I, it was, I'd been a member of parliament three, three years by that time, the tax rate on the richest Canadians was 80%. Eight, note that, 80% if you're a high income person. Doesn't mean 80% is taken away, as most of you will understand. It just means when you reach that high income level, all the money after that level, you're taxed at 80% rate. That has shriveled to 50% today. So 90, as recent as 1971, the very wealthy were paying their share. And in fact, if you go back towards World War II, the percentage at the top was even higher than 80%. But as recent as 1971, it, uh, the richest Canadians were paying their share, but they've dropped all the way down to 50% is, is the maximum rate now. So it's no, no big surprise that we should have inequality the degree that we, we have today. And I will also add that during that period, the post-war period, 45, and I would say right up to 1975, we had high levels of economic growth. So contrary to what liberals and conservatives like to say, well, if you have these high tax rates, you're not going to have a functioning economy. It's not true. We had higher rates of growth, less inequality, more justice, and new social programs, all at that time with higher tax rates. Well, I've gone longer than I already than I planned, Michael, but that's my opening comment. Now I'm happy to respond to some questions you have. I want to start with a question from one of our youth members, actually from Paige's grandmother, and Paige is sitting over there, and uh, Paige's grandmother, through Paige, asks, um, why did you become a politician, and why did you seek the leadership of the party? 
I am tempted to say, it's an honest one, when I ran first in 1971, I was in a downtown con Toronto constituency, High Park constituency in Toronto, as a matter of fact, when somebody asked me the, the latter question, why did I run for the leadership? And I hesitated for a second and said, well, my, my mother told me she dropped me on my head when I was a baby. <laughs> This, this question, having been asked by a psychiatrist, showing his kind of judgment, he decided to support me for the leadership right away when I answered. Uh, but it wasn't that way, of course. Let me, I, I, I will attribute this, frankly, uh, the, why did I get involved in politics and in what I would call just working for the public good, or as a public good as I would say it, was a very profound influence, I think, from my, my, my mother, who was not ideological, not philosophical, but she was a profoundly uh, humanitarian person, very kind, very thoughtful, and I think I took in my social democracy with my mother's blood. Um, I always respected and indeed loved her as a human being, and I think if I managed to acquire some capacity for empathy for other human beings and their situation, it's through that influence uh, that comes well before any political theorizing, but for me lay, laid the foundation for concern, especially for social democratic concern, uh, working for the public good. Why, why run for the leadership? I guess, you know, when you're young, when I first ran, uh, when Tommy stepped down. Um, it's an extension of when someone, Chris, wants to be a candidate. Someone wants to be involved in his or her riding, and then you, when you, you were elected, as I was, then I, I saw some people of my older generation. I thought it was time that they got out of the way. We needed some newer ideas in the party. And as to be quite candid, that time when I ran, David Lewis, was uh, the contestant and he won. And I agreed afterwards, he should have won. And David and I worked for a long time together um, before he stepped down as leader and then I succeeded him. But I think if wanting to be a leader more or less, if you've got support of your caucus colleague, is an extension about why you want to get into politics in the first place. You can get to be, a, if you're a leader, you're in a position that you obviously can do more. Uh, than otherwise would be the case. That's all. I'm glad you mentioned David Lewis because uh, he electrified Canadians in the 1972 election with his his campaign against corporate welfare bumps, as many of you will remember. And uh, he reduced the Liberals to minority status with that brilliant campaign. And the Canadian public elected the greatest number of NDP MPs until the 1980 election when you were leader and you elected more. What would you like to see as the NDP's electrifying slogan in this election coming up? Well, I'm not sure I can come up in 30 seconds with a slogan. Um, <laughs> but I, but I end, whatever the slogan is, and, and and I hope it's an effective one. Um, I meant what I said when I uh, was praising Chris and your, your, your candidate having said, and I read his brochure that he said it's time to emphasize blue collar workers. I, I think whatever the slogan is, it must capture that. We must, if, if you look up the wording, and I did it recently when I did some writing for the Globe and Mail on populism, and there was a quote, I think, that was taken from the Globe article in that, in Chris's brochure. I, I just for once, I looked at a uh, Oxford Dictionary definition of populism, and it, what it says, it's, it's a politics that emphasizes ordinary people. And that, I think, has to be crucial. I've often said with friends, and I'll say it here in public now, Mr. Trudeau, uh, as, as we all know, been saying ever since he was elected, that he's working for the middle class. Um, well, I frequently, when I hear that, say, well, if there's a middle class in Canada, and there certainly is, and that's probably the majority in the middle, but it also means that there's an upper class, and by the way, 
continuing under Mr. Uh, Trudeau, have all kinds of tax ex exemptions favorable to them, but there's also a working class. If you, have, if you have a middle class, you have a working class. And, and I have a strong feeling that the power and influence of government should be put a lot of emphasis on, on working people, blue collar people, because those of us who are, are in the middle class or if you're in the top 1%, are able to look after ourselves pretty well. But to really build a, a solid society, you have to look after those ordinary working people. I'm not, the, the populist message, when the CCF came into being, back in, when there's a movement in the prairies of farmers, farmers, wor workers, intellectuals, they all came together to put the emphasis on programs that would bring benefits to ordinary people. And so whatever the slogan is, whatever the slogan is, I think it has to capture that. It has to, to say, we're on their side. Uh, we're not just wishy-washy to say, trying to be all things to all people, but we're on the side of ordinary people, and we will always use government power in that line, whether it's for tax reform or needed programs like pharmacare, we stand up for ordinary people. So I'm, I'm not gonna give a slogan now, but I, I do want to con convey a, a kind of sense that during when the campaign comes and Jagmeet Singh and his staff think of slogans, it, 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 it should be one that aims in that kind of direction anyway. I, I, I want you to just expand on that a tiny bit, is why you want to put this emphasis on working class voters. Um, you know, I've looked at polls that show that uh, Mr. Trudeau in 2015 uh, got most of the working class vote. Uh, in 2019, it's disappearing from him, and again, the same polls say it's going to the Conservatives. Why isn't it going to us? And what kind of policies would we have as a party that would bring the working class vote into the NDP okay. camp? Well, I'll, I'll give an answer to two parts of that. I think in the last federal campaign, uh, Mr. Trudeau did offer a, a progressive agenda on promised tax reform. He promised a, a lot of initi initiatives towards the indigenous peoples. Um, but particularly, he, he conveyed the impression that he would use the economy in the way that I think I've just said it should be used. But, and, and to be candid, Mr. Mulcair, from my point of view, uh, made the tactical and substantive mistake he, and said he would balance budgets. He would not, he would not go into debt and he would uh, return, return to surplus after one year and Mr. Trudeau gave a more, on the economic policy side, a more progressive answer to that. And we lost some ground, in my, my belief in, in, in that, on the social democratic agenda. And that's not, it's, it's I'm, no politician is perfect, and we're all fallible, but I think that, that, was, a, that was a mistake. In, in terms of what's going on now, I, I have a clear picture. Let me put it this way, when I became leader, of the party in 1975, I, I was lucky that there was no election to 1979. Why was I lucky? Because it gave me four years for the people of Canada to even know I existed. Now just think about it. Uh, uh, right, two or three years after I became leader, hardly anybody in the country knew I was leader of the NDP. But by the fourth year, they did. And it's because the third parties in Canada get almost no news. Let me just, if I, how many, how many of you, for, for example, have seen Mr. Jagmeet Singh on the news a lot? Have you seen, how many, put up your hands if you've seen him on the news a lot? Yeah, two people maybe. But, and, but he hasn't been, and he hasn't been, and I don't fault him. I'm saying, I'm trying to answer Michael's second question. Why, if in the short run right now, Mr. Trudeau's in a lot of trouble, appropriately he's in a lot of trouble, more of that support, some has started to come to the NDP, but more of it 
it seems to have gone in the short run to the conservatives. And I'm saying the major reason, in my view, is that Mr. Singh is not known. He only got elected to the House uh, less than a year ago, months ago. He became, rather, a member of the House of Commons. So he hasn't had a chance to come to, to, come to Owen Sound, to go to Toronto, to go to Halifax, to go to uh, British Columbia. He's been in British Columbia because that's where he got elected. But it takes time to get known. And, and he is now in the House of Commons, and we've got a good chance because of the difficulties the federal liberals have run into, I think, for Mr. Singh to have a real impact. Uh, people do change their mind a lot now in elections. They pay attention to parties and programs. And I, I deeply believe that the, the Conservative Party of Canada, is no, under Mr. Scheer, is no, no progressive response whatsoever to the, to the Liberal Party. And if Mr. Singh is now given a chance and is get, gets known uh, now that he's leader, I think we can pick up uh, steam and support and do well in the coming election. You uh, mentioned in the car coming up that uh, you talked about the the daughters of the vote incident uh, when uh -huh. young women were in the House of Commons and uh, um, and Trudeau spoke to them and 45 or 50 of them stood up and turned their backs on them and we saw that on the media but as you pointed out Jagmeet Singh also spoke and got a standing ovation. Right. I don't know if you follow that in the news a, a week ago there was a a bringing together of young women in the House of Commons, filled all the seats. They were selected in communities all across the country. And I saw the news that night, and I saw Mr. Trudeau on the news, and as Michael has just said, uh, a number turned out, stood up when he made reference to indigenous politics in particular, and that's when there's a lot of problems going on with the resignation of the former <coughs> justice committee. Many turned their back on Mr. Trudeau, and that, that was mentioned at least. Then. Uh, Mr. Shearer was mentioned, uh, and, and in fact, a number of walked, the young women walked out on him. But they didn't even mention Mr. Singh. And I didn't, I thought, oh, well, maybe he wasn't there. I should have known better. And a friend show, sent me the next day a video that was taken. Mr. Singh spoke to the same young women, and he got not one, but two standing ovations. Two standing ovations from young women from right across kind of the country and, and speaking to them, but there was nothing in the news, nothing in the, either the CBC or CTV television, which I had checked that night. So that that's one of the problems. And I repeat, I had I had experience of, of this as leader of the third party. I can tell you, for a long time, working to get any news coverage at all. And that's, this is a good example of what Mr. Singh is still going through. The, one of the things that does happen during an election is the media do uh, acquire suddenly out of the blue some sense of obligation of paying a little more attention. So I think the closer we get to uh, a natural the fe federal date for the campaign, <coughs> I think we will get more news coverage. I, I want to, I hope you're right. First of all, but I, I also want to bring you to some of the problems we face in a riding like this. Um, in the 40 odd years that I've been around here, we, it's been a conservative riding except twice when there was a liberal elected. Uh, some Canadians won't consider voting NEP because of strategic voting concerns because of misconceptions they have about socialism. Do you think that the NDP needs to spend more time um, addressing some of those concerns, addressing people's worries about voting for the party, their uncertainties about voting for the party? And I guess the question I'm asking is, is do Canadians know who we are? I think, broadly speaking, they do. They do. They have some some idea. I mean, we are now we're now the official opposition in the province of Ontario, and we had once formed a government here, and we've been in the majority of provinces now. We've formed a government across the country, in the, in the majority of them, and and by the way, one of the most remarkable people in the whole country 
is having an election on Tuesday in Alberta, and I hope Rachel Notley is, is re-elected, an outstanding person. Uh, uh, I, uh, so I, I think that people in general have a, an idea of what we're about, uh, and then it's up to uh, local candidates and the party leader at the time to get uh, flesh out the details of a, a campaign. Uh, but I, I really do believe we have to be authentic. We can't. We have to, to use a cliche, say what we mean and mean what we say, and and acknowledge. By the way, we all come from different political backgrounds. My my father, God bless him, he was a, a conservative until he was 60, and then he smartened up, and he he, he did change. And so I think, and that can be a metaphor for writings right across the country that, well, I heard that you came second in the provincial, uh, recent provincial campaign here. Well, if you, you came second this time with a, a good candidate and with a, a good uh, platform, I see no reason why we can't win. We have to have that assumption that we can win and get out and do it. You know? What's, if you don't consider this question too simple, what's, what's the best way for the NDP in a riding like this uh, to appeal to conservative, liberal, and green voters? Uh, what's, is this a bad question? No, it's, I think it's a good question, but it's, it's a bad question for somebody outside the answer, riding to answer, in a way. I, and I, I, deeply, I deeply believe that. I mean, I won in Oshawa, in 1968, I bet there are not many of you know this, by 15 votes. In 1968 in Oshawa, we had never held that seat before, federally, never. And out of 45,000 votes, I won by 15. I used to say, well, I, on the, I went up by 100% on the recount because on election night I only won by eight. And then after, uh, after the recount, it went up to 50. But then fortunately, it, it continued to climb every election after that. Um, but one of the reasons, one of the reasons is uh, it was my hometown. So I had some feel, some feel of the concerns of my own neighbors, the people I grew up with as a kid. And I did, I did, I could tell you, I went to about 60% of the doors knocking in that constituency. Um, in the in the summer of 1968, so you you pick up you pick up issues locally that you can tie in with the local with the national campaign. I think that is very important. It's not you know for example I wouldn't claim to be to understate it considerably an expert on farming myself to say the least. But so if I were running in this <coughs> riding, I would I hope I would acquire at least my osmosis and talking to my neighbors and be sensitive to what the farming issue is that can be related to the agricultural aspect of the of the national campaign but I as an outsider can't come in and say you know what that sh should be I, I simply don't know but I would uh, think your new candidate will have some feel with his campaign team what what really uh, what concerns real concerns not just abstract ones the real concerns are the men and women are at this meeting and the men and women and, and their families here who live here. So I think, I think a national campaign has to be localized, including in your le literature leaflet that's going out. The national campaign is important. We all know that. Canadians pay attention to the leader. Whether they like the leader or not does matter. But also your own candidate and, and the people's sense the party here is addressing their concerns is very important. If we don't address their concerns, we don't deserve to get their votes. It's as simple as that, like, or as complex as that. I mean, let me just say one other thing. I have a very good friend who, in, as a matter of fact, is managing Rachel Notley's campaign as we sit here. He's in Alberta. And he wrote a piece recently about politics. And his opening line was, and I quoted this back to many people, nobody knows anything about politics. <laughs> that was his line. And there's an important truth in that. Most of what we say politically, and I apply to myself too, are guesses and judgments. And we hope we're right. 
we have the right set of values, but when we come to recommend policies and, and, and suggest where this should happen and that happen, it's guesswork. It's hopeful, hopefully it's informed guesswork and based on good values, but anyone that claims they know all the answers, beware. <laughs> so. You, uh, in your, in your uh, opening remarks a few minutes ago, you, you, you put a lot of emphasis on inequality and the existence of yeah. inequality. What, what advice can you give us as to what the best policies are to tackle inequality. And just let me give you a, a, a small illustration of this. Um, I work a lot with the pollster Frank Graves of Ecos Research, and one of his, one of his dramatic findings that, that I quote as often as I can is that in 2000, 70% uh, 70 75% of Canadians identified as middle, self-identified as middle class. In 2018, 19, that number is less than 45%. So what makes someone wake up in the morning and say, God, I'm no longer middle class? What, what, why are people slipping out of the middle oh, class? Boy. It's because of inequality. But how do we address that and how do we as a party with Chris, go door to door and say, look, you know, these are our proposals. Okay, let, let me do two things. Try to offer my, I, I just said, no one knows anything about politics. But I will try to give the answer about what should be done, some programs about inequality. But let me first mention why inequality is important. It's, it's not just an abstract idea that has no relevance. We now have a lot, a lot of information about the kinds of effects of more equal or less equal societies, what goes on. The, there's two authors that produced a remarkable book just more than half a dozen years ago. Their names Wil Wilkinson and Pickett. And the book, it is, the book is called The Spirit Level. And they document from looking at, oh, about 15 countries around the world, what actually goes on in those countries, depending on the degree of inequality. And what they, what they found is inequality matters. It matters if more, more equal societies have, note this, less crime. More equal societies have less, fewer teenage pregnancies. More equal societies have greater upward mobility. If you're poor, born in a poor family, a greater chance of going up into, say, a professional job or something, the more equal the society is. That is, the more equal the distribution of income. And it, it, it turns out that, say, an average person in the Scandinavian countries, which are the most equal, has a much greater chance of advancement in life than most of the, most of the even upper income Americans in changing their position. And if you're an American, your, your life expectancy is less than that someone in Scandinavia or in Sweden because <coughs> Sweden is a more equal society. So everyone is affected. Health, health outcomes are seriously affected. The, the more equal society you have, the, the healthy overall, uh, healthier overall are, are the people growing up in that. So th this is why a lot of social scientists now are looking at this, whatever their ideological positions were before, and said inequality matters, really. So it's not, to make the point in a different way, it's not just poverty of children. Let me give the Trudeau government credit for something. They did a uh, re reduction of child poverty was a, a significant thing in, in, the, in the last few years. So 300,000 lifted out of child poverty. I, I just want to point out that you were the one who introduced uh, the bill into Parliament uh, calling for an end to child poverty. That's true. In 1989, everybody, everybody worked the Liberals, the Conservatives, they all supported this, said we should put an end to child poverty by 
2000. That was 11 years. They could have had an agenda. We could have done it. But anyway, I want to do the one thing that the Trudeau government has done uh, is taken action on child poverty. But the point I want to make is we still are as unequal in terms of income distribution in Canada today as when Mr. Trudeau was elected four years ago. And that means all these other things I'm talking about, health outcomes, teenage pregnancies, um, the chance of, of advancing, um, having getting a university education, even if your family never had it and were there before, are all reduced because of inequality. So inequality matters. That's what I want to say. It's not just an abstract thing. If we have a more equal society, everyone, everyone in that society is better off. Okay, how do you deal with it? Well, in, in Canada, part of it is, is income tax. I already mentioned that at the, top, the top rates of income tax are only fi are 50 percent now. As recent as 1971, I told you it was 80 percent was the top rate. So we can raise taxes on the uh, upper levels. We can also remove some of those um, loopholes and the tax havens and the Caribbean and other places that um, affluent people have put their money and we haven't pursued them for tax reasons. So tax policy is something. Housing is a major concern. And Mr. Singh has talked about that. We have to do something about increasing the supply of housing at, at moderate and low income levels. And so that deals with inequality by in increasing the housing, changing tax rates does it. Pharmacare, the one national program, you know, all, all other countries that have a national health care system, all the countries in Western Europe, Britain, Scandinavia, Germany, France, pharmaceutical products are included. It was not included in Canada when we brought ours in, and it's long overdue. We should have a national pharmacare program that is a right of all citizens, you know. And so, so that, that's, that's another aspect of inequality. So there's, there's housing, there's income tax, there are, there are health benefits. So if you take inequality as a serious issue, you would have your, your cabinet would have, a, have, have a, a cabinet committee on it that could involve many departments and say, what's your agenda over the next three years to build a more equal <coughs> country? So I gave some, <coughs> some examples, anyway, of, of concrete action that could be taken to produce a more equal society. Okay. When, we, uh, when we look across the border, we see some remarkable things starting to happen in the, in the Democratic Party. Uh, people like Bernie Sanders, uh, Alexandria, uh, um, Let's see her pronounce her name. <laughs> I'm not going to try. Ocasio-Cortez, thank you. Yeah. Um, starting to call themselves socialists. All right. And, and wanting very clearly to move the, the Democratic Party to the left. And they wouldn't be doing this if they didn't think they were getting some traction with it. Can this happen to the NDP in Canada? Can we... Can we Clear, more clearly move ourselves to the left? Do we need to? No, I, th I think we have. And, and it's up to Mr. Singh, and I think he'll make this clear. Federal policy will come out to show we are on the left. If, we, if we're not a, le a left par party, we should pack up and go home. I mean, that's, that's, that's why we're here. You know? uh, and, 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 and by the way, on that, the other thing we do is point to examples, like John Horgan at Broadband Institute Conference last week in Ottawa, we had Mr. Horgan on, who's an absolutely wonderful guy, um, as Premier. He was supposed to come, but the party whip wouldn't let him out of British Columbia because they, of the minority government. <laughs> they were afraid the government could be brought down. So he did a big video, and, and modern technology being what it is, he was coming in on the screen, and questions were being put, put to him from the audience, sort of like, you're here directed to him and he was answering. And here's part of the things that we should be explaining as when we, you know, talk about bringing in a, a, a national program as I just did, like Pharmacare, we can point to government success. Do you know in BC, 
They had the highest average wage increase in the province of British Columbia in the past year at 4%. They had the highest economic growth rate of any of the provinces in the past year in British Columbia and with an NDP government. And they had the, and, and the economists love this, the best debt to GDP ratio in the country. So all the financial institutions think BC is doing fine. So BC, and by the way, BC has been moving decisively on environmental programs, indigenous peoples programs, and programs for seniors. So we've got the, one of the best performing governments in the country out in BC that we can refer to, I think, when we have discussions with our neighbors. But I come back to something I really believe in, that we just have to be ourselves. Oh, let me one, add one other thing. Michael raises a question. Should we call ourselves democratic socialists or something? And I say, by all means. I used to say, use the terms interchangeably. Social democrat, democratic socialists, where that's, that's the broad roots of our <laughs> party here and elsewhere. But I once heard Dave Barrett, some of you are as old as I am, or not quite, and, uh, or maybe some even older, I don't know. Uh, but Dave Barrett, as you know, they will know, was Premier of British Columbia. Wonderful, colorful, dynamic guy. And he was on an open line program in British Columbia one day, and I was in town in my hotel room and I heard him. And this guy, it was this person, was calling in to him and said, uh, well, Mr. Barrett, I like what you're doing for, I think he did some dental care program. I like what you're doing, but he says, you're a social, socialism, that I don't like socialism. Then he said, oh, you did this for mortgage rates. I like that too, uh, but he, you're socialist. I don't like that. So he went through about four other things and Barrett kept saying, well, did you like that? And the guy said, yeah, but I don't like socialism. So Barrett said, well, call up porridge then. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's a good reply, you know. What's, what's in the label? It's what, you, it's what you're doing that matters, uh, fundamentally, I think. Uh, so call it porridge. All right. I want to... I, <laughs> I, I, I want to come back to the idea of the Green New Deal, which is, as I listen to Alexandria <laughs> Ocasio-Cortez and uh, her Senate uh, counterpart talk about it, is that it, it's it's a restructuring of capitalism? It's a restructure. It's a it, it's a tossing out of neoliberalism. It's a, a rebuilding of the economy and uh, as a green economy. Right. Um, if we can't do it ourselves as a, as an ND, as the New Democrats, what do you think of? the idea of a, of a green NDP common ground coalition to push this even harder. Well, Do you think that's necessary? Do you think it would help? Uh, two, two points. First of all, about transforming our, the, the economy in, into one that has economic um, growth in the traditional sense, uh, but also with uh, built into it environmental concerns in terms of impact, the integration, which in their different ways, the government as BC is trying to do and, and Rachel Notley is trying to do in a very different economy in, in Alberta. So I, uh, the objective, I think, and we know this from the most recent report out of the United Nations, the global warming is, is anyway, not to be glib at all, is, is very serious and Canada is uh, heating up at twice the rate, twice the rate than the average uh, country in the world. So it's something we have to take seriously and, and be doing more, even if we meet the Liberal government's uh, targets and their programs are not designed to meet it, uh, we're going to be short. We're short for the, the Paris Accord objectives. So I think we have to move more decisively across the board in environmental directions. And uh, if then I get into the coalition government or, or campaigning together. That is always an immensely complicated thing in any given constituency. And I'm, I, I think the short answer I would give is, you again, you answer honestly that if 
if you're in what we call a minority government situation, <coughs> by far the party that would be closest to us in the agenda would be the Green Party, as it was in British Columbia. So there is now a, you know, a coalition arrangement between the Green Party and, and the NDP in British Columbia. And they have sat down and worked out an agenda uh, where the Greens will give support to the NDP, not vote confidence to bring them down, want to cover a certain agenda. And I think if, if the parties end up after an election with that kind of minority situation with no one having a, a majority and natural working together, uh, the most natural working together would be the, the Green and the NDP, but I don't think either party, and I can't, spe I can't speak for the NDP, obviously, and, and nor certainly can I speak for the Greens, but I th think that they, I'd be surprised if the, the leaders in the campaign jointly um, uh, campaign together, because that would introduce just too many complexities in campaigning that, uh, just think about it for a minute, um, uh, but they would have to campaign as we traditionally campaign uh, and then see what happens um, in terms of voters making decisions and electing if they give a majority or not, but if they don't, then be quite candid in being trying to work out on, uh, say, an environmental agenda with the Green Party uh, I, would seem to me to make perfectly good sense. Given the uh, repeated rejection of proportional, represent proportional representation by BC voters, um, do you think it will be possible to achieve electoral reform um, at the provincial or the federal level uh, through a referendum, or has it got to be done some other way? I think the results, uh, in particular in BC, set back uh, electoral reform for quite a while in terms of their, including myself, I'm a longtime advocate of a, uh, a system that they now have in, in Scotland, they now have in New Zealand, they now have in Germany, which is a mixed system of first past the post and, and proportional representation is uh, one that I think would ver work very well for our kind of country. But that lost in, in BC, and it's a large province. And so I think, uh, from a referendum point of view, it's not something that I think in, for maybe a few years down the road, uh, people would be open to. I, I think it's, <laughs> we have to respect uh, the judgment so far, and we haven't won that battle. And, but uh, maybe we'll have to come back to it another yeah. time. Given that the, <coughs> the, the Liberals haven't shown all that much progress uh, with reconciliation, uh, even with what at first seemed to be very good intent, how can we as a party uh, address the inequities and the systemic racism that seem built into our government when dealing with Indigenous peoples? And what would the face of the NDP look like in addressing Indigenous inequities? Well, I, I think, again, it's so complicated. Uh, Jody Wilson-Hurbo, um, <coughs> as minister, um, once had fundamental responsibility in this area, and the Liberal government, and oh, what's, what's her name from Toronto? The, uh, Carolyn Bennett. Carolyn Bennett. I think those two people were doing a good job. They were trying to redress, in terms of our relationship with Indigenous peoples, a lot of historical wrongdoing. Um, <coughs> I would like to think, uh, notwithstanding this terrible resignations at the top and Mr. Trudeau's ministries, I would like to think that they're, they're continuing um, to make structural um, uh, changes in, in enabling indigenous peoples to have higher degrees of self-government over their own territories, which they're doing again in BC in downtown Vancouver. They've just, a, a, a new announcement of major housing developments going to go in. It's totally under the control and 
initiative of indigenous peoples. I think, if I can put it this way, at least between what we were doing and have been doing, and, and again, Horgan's doing in BC, and the national liberal efforts, I think we're moving in the same direction. And if there's one area in, in policy that I would like to see um, almost taken out of politics, partisan politics, is, is indigenous peoples. Uh, I think we have great obligations there um, to be, uh, to try to work um, with each other. Uh, and I, I think in this area that we are much closer to the liberals and I know that uh, Jody wilson Rebo, there was, there were efforts made to get her to run for us as a liberals and she could be, she'd be just as much of maybe she will yet become a new Democrat. But the, the, the point I guess I want to make, Michael, is I think initiatives have finally been launched by the Liberal government in this direction. They're bogged down in this other terrible issue with that corporation. Uh, but I would like to think that they, the, the efforts that have been la launched, uh, not only in, in dealing as, as the uh, message was read out from Charlie Angus today, concrete uh, where people are living and getting healthy, getting safe water and accommodation, that kind of agenda item, uh, which the Liberals were starting finally to do some work on. Um, I'm taking a long way to say I, I think they were moving in the same direction, and although there's change at the top ministerially, uh, I hope that will keep up and that the NDP will be pushing in the same direction, basically. Let me, let me bring this to a close by saying um, uh, I'm glad that you brought up uh, Jody Wilson-Raybould because... Oh, of course. I'm sorry. Is that could, better? I, could you hear should, me all right? Okay. Yeah, my apologies. You should have yelled at me earlier. Uh, you're welcome. Um, it's, it's, it strikes me as it's, it's interesting that of all the questions that we received from, that I received from members of the, of the Riding Association, there wasn't one question about SNC Lavalin and, and uh, Jody wilson Rebel. So my question to you is, I know what that says to me, that the important issues on the minds of Canadians uh, are inequality, uh, are, uh, are the climate, are climate change. But I'm, I'm more interested in what you think as to whether this is really a top of the mind issue, whether, we're, whether it's going to be with us uh, in October when the election campaign is on. What do you think? Well, first of all, I think it is a serious issue, whether it's how deeply it's spread across the country, I won't <laughs> presume to guess. It's had some effect because the popularity of the government's gone down and it started to go down rather precipitously after this scandal broke. So it's having some effect. Well, let me go whether it'll last or not. Who knows? Uh, if it'll last up to the election time in the fall. The summer will come, people are doing other things, other issues will be raised. So I, do, I don't know if it will stay with us, but I have absolutely no doubt that the government was wrong in this. Uh, I think the evidence is overwhelmingly clear that inappropriate pressure, if not the breaking of the law, which uh, Jody wilson Herbo herself said the law had been broken, but inappropriate pressure has been, was put on her as minister to intervene inappropriately in this corporate decision. Uh, I, I would venture to guess that 80% of those who have expertise, over 80% in this area, would agree. So Mr. Trudeau and his clerk of the Privy Council and his own principal advisor were putting undue pressure on a, on a minister who was involved in a judicial situation, wearing her hat as attorney general, in which politics were supposed to be separated out entirely from the decision. My own advice, and Mr. Trudeau doesn't turn to me for advice, but if, if I were his senior advisor, I would have 
once, once she pointed out that to him and wasn't going to back down, he should have had enough sense. He was the prime minister. It was bad judgment on his part. I deeply believe if he had apologized and he said, you're wrong, remember I repeat, she said up to that point, no law had been broken, but he was clearly putting pressure to do the wrong, to go in the wrong direction. If he had said, okay, I apologize, once this came out, if he said, I apologize for this, uh, I was wrong, and by the way, he shouldn't have fired her out of the ministry either, he could have sa saved himself a lot of trouble. But in, so in, in political life, as in many other aspects of life, if you've done something wrong, it's better to acknowledge it quickly, that you make a mistake, you're not infallible, and then try to move on. The big problem with Mr. Trudeau handling this, he didn't handle it well as a prime minister at all. He kept putting his foot in. And the, and the last thing, an incredible political decision, he decided to, to sweat, threaten to sue the leader of the official opposition. I've heard of a lot of crazy things, but that's among the craziest. So he, they, they should have got out of it sooner. Uh, I don't know if they, but they were wrong. And uh, there's no one, I think, who knows about the issues, seriously disagrees with that. But whether it will be, uh, you know, uh, the leading issue or a leading issue by the time the fall comes, I, I think that's a moot point, and I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want to guess. I don't know. Thank you so much for giving no. us your time. It's just no. been great. No. It's good. No. 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 Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Matthew Trowbridge. I am the president of the Bruce Gray Owen Sound NDP riding. Uh, I just wanted to take a second to thank everyone, first of all, for coming out to this wonderful event. Uh, I want to thank the, our honored guest, Ed Broadbent. He came a long way to speak to us today. I want to formally congratulate our new candidate, Chris Stevens. It, it's not hard to, or I'm sorry, it's not easy to step up and put yourself out there and run for political office. And uh, that speech was amazing, by the way. Uh, find, we have somebody now that is representing blue collar workers and, of course, hockey enthusiasts. Uh, we wish him great success. I want to thank the organizers and volunteers that made this event possible. Uh, without them, we wouldn't have been able to do anything today. Fantastic work, guys. And uh, I also want to thank the Harmony Center for making this fantastic uh, venue available to us. It's been great. We also do have our, our monthly meetings here, and it's the perfect location. Thank you, guys. Uh, and I want to thank you all just, you know, for showing up and on a Saturday and listening to what everyone had to say.